Мерси. А, много ми се иска да мога да дам тази лекция на български, а, но за нещастта има толкова много термини и всички материали са на английски, така че ще ми е много по-лесно да го направя на английски. Uh, so I hope you don't mind. And uh, today, as uh, kindly introduced, we'll be talking about open source as a business. And to me, there are sort of three components to how you might look at this topic, and we're going to talk at length about different companies and about different examples and some of my own experiences with two different companies. Uh, we're going to go through a strategy of how you might make money with open source, the unique struggles that bringing money into open source uh, creates, and the success, or well, at least the appearance of success, and what other problems you might encounter following commercial success. Uh, and I want to thank my colleague, Philip, uh, who's thought a lot about this and, who, and whose work this presentation is based on. So first, let's start talking about the two, two components. Are we talking about open source? We're talking about business. So let's talk about a bit of what open source is. Um, we're using the open source um, definition, the OSD. According to it, open source is um, under a license or licenses that allow the software to be freely used, modified, and shared. And then there is another very common definition, capital F free software, which allows the freedoms to use, study, share, and improve the software. And this sort of focuses more on the freedom aspects or the liberties aspects in open source. I think that to me, focuses more on the technical and business aspects. Right, so we're talking about open source, what it is, and so what is business? Who among you can answer this? Like, does anybody have an answer for what business is? All right, yeah, a few people, cool. Um, so it, it's a bit of a weird question, isn't it? It's super general. But it's important, and we'll, um, we'll come back to these concepts later. Like the first principles of business, at least that's how um, we're going to look at them here, are value generation, so you build something useful, and value capture, you have other people pay you money for the thing you built. And inside value capture, we have value proposition and clear communication. So like, I'm telling you what it is that me or like my services or my product are going to offer you. And this to me is actually the essence of sales. Like sales doesn't have to be sleazy tactics and like used car salesman type stuff. Um, it's simply saying what it is that you'll get out of this and what uh, money I'm willing to accept for it. And so this is a little bit too abstract, so let's uh, make it a little, you know, more concrete. Imagine I make a cake. I think, I hope we can all agree that this is value generation. I generated some value by baking you a cake. I will give you this cake in exchange for five lever. That's a value proposition. Right? Now I've, this, is, this is selling. That's, that's it, there's nothing more to it. Maybe there's a little bit more to selling, but you know, fundamentally that's what it is. Right. Now, it's a juicy cake, not dry like in the other shops. Its um, smell reminds you of childhood books that you read again and again that you couldn't put down. It reminds you of warm summer evenings and cold autumn mornings where you uh, ate a cake with a glass of cold milk. It reminds you of your grandmother's cooking. It reminds you of songs whose lyrics you have long forgotten. I can sell you this nostalgic shadow of your unachievable childhood for 12 leva. This is marketing. And in open source, you will make the cake as a developer, I'm assuming most of your devs, uh, but the question is who gets to market the cake and who goes to market with the cake? These are two different things. And uh, who captures value from, from offering the cake? And in open source, um, you know, it's, these are separated, right? Like, if I have a cake, then I'm kind of somewhat implicitly the owner of this cake, and I will license it to you for eating for a given amount of money. Uh, but in open source, that's not necessarily the case, right? One a team of people or a person can build a thing, and someone else can monetize it. So who here uses open source? Uh, yeah, uh, it's open fest, right? Um, who's opening issues to contribute to open source projects? All right, cool. Uh, a, a little less. Who is contributing code to open source projects? 
Okay, yeah, and documentation and the kind of other things around the coordination. Cool. Now, if you have a project yourself, uh, who here is making money from open source for your definition of that? One, two, three. All right, okay, that's actually an impressive number of people. Um, so, for the first three, this is like a, a pretty uh, famous comic. You know, everybody wants to have something nice to use, uh, but then it gets a little bit more, uh, the, the room gets emptier and less enthusiastic when you're asked to do some work. And, uh, and who wants to have the hard job of a maintainer? And yeah, there's uh, almost no one, at least not for long, once the, the glamour of it wears off, which is pretty quickly. Um, this is a very typical situation. So this is uh, by Puppet but the founder of Puppet, 98.5% of the code written in Puppet, he estimates, is written by people he paid to put that code there. Right? So because when we say open source, we have this vision of a community enthusiasm, and it is super important, but in the sense of open source combined with business, it's uh, often like this. Uh, so this is important, right? This not just the commercialization aspect, but you got salaries to pay. Uh, Elastic is, I don't know the number, but it's extremely similar. Um, so open source is not a business model. Um, it's arguably better in every single way for humanity and for everything around us than closed source, but it's not a way to make money. It's a, literally a software distribution model. Or you could even argue it's just a software licensing model if you're talking about open source specifically. And then you have to add even more stuff to distribute it. So it's, it's very basic. It's, it's not a way to make money. So you need to, to think of that. Um, this is what uh, Shai Bannon says. He's the founder of Elastic uh, and the original author of Elasticsearch. So this is an engineer, right? He wrote the, the library like um, or nine years ago, the, the data store, sorry. And um, after that, he built it in, with his co-founders um, into a public company. So this is on the public financial markets now, and its valuation is, I think, this morning was $5.9 billion. Uh, and that's what, how he thinks of open source now. It's a distribution model uh, that allows us to build a community. It's a force multiplier for the things we do. But we'll see, like, it's, you know, it doesn't pay the salaries of the nearly 2,000 colleagues that I have. Um, so we're, here we start with the lots of examples in various areas. Uh, this is the logo of Datomic. It's a data store that's close to the closure uh, programming language, but its adoption, is, well, maybe they would argue otherwise, but um, it seems that it has somewhat stalled. Uh, they actually have a lot of technically very interesting features. Uh, transactions, chronologies, um, AWS as a first-class citizen. They have like metered pricing. Uh, this is their uh, their pricing models. They have like a no cost, and then they have like a kind of a standard pro. And then you you know enterprises like the Oracle like talk to us, and it will cost you a lot of money. Um, but it's not open source, and for a data store that can really hamper adoption. And this is like self-admittedly by the founders of Elastic, it's one reason why Elasticsearch was made open source. Uh, so I'm a community advocate for Elastic, so basically I go around and talk about what things you can do with the technology. Um, and we'll see, we'll see how, the, so the model that Elastic has is like a freemium model, I guess, like we give a lot of value away for free that you can use, and we'll talk at the very end about uh, exactly how that works. But these are the primary projects that we have. So Elasticsearch, um, in case you haven't heard of it. Uh, actually, who here has not heard of Elasticsearch? Okay, a couple of people, right. So Elasticsearch is an open source search engine. Uh, then the other stuff is basically a UI to put on top of it. And the, um, oh, there. And the other two projects here are to help with a particular use case, which is logging and monitoring and storing logs in it. Uh, there's actually a lot of uses for it. Um, so here is our current, like from yesterday, uh, our current solution offering. So as you can see, like you've gone quite a way away from um, just having the open source stuff. And now we sell like a lot of other stuff and we don't only position ourselves based on the open source uh, projects. And we'll see that 
elsewhere in other companies too. Uh, in terms of users, this is so GitHub, uh, GitHub Stack Overflow, uh, Wikipedia. Yes, um, uses uh, they've these have used for years and years. So if you've used these websites, <laughs> then you've used Elasticsearch. Um, but you know, like that's great, and we have some even more interesting use cases. Actually, like we have uh, NASA is using this for metrics on the Mars rover. Uh, Uber uses this for like a geo search of matching you with drivers. Well, not anymore in Bulgaria, I guess. But um, uh, Tinder uses this, which yeah, I guess is a kind of search as well. Um, but you know, they, it was, we have all of these users. Uh, we were probably used in every single country around the world, I guess, by this point. Uh, but the question is, okay, so how do we sustain uh, people to work on this? And uh, I need to warn you that like this my this is the perspective of um, more of a company that has developed around the project and it sort of sits on top of these projects. Like Elastic thinks that it owns these projects. Like the projects are Elastic and Elastic is the projects. Uh, whereas you see in other companies that they kind of try to give it away to the community. So Elastic did not go down that path. And um, I think like the main reason for that is that they looked at the various models that those companies have and they decided that none of them were going to work. Like maybe it was, uh, they were outdated or just wouldn't work with that software and those use cases. Um, so we're going to chat through uh, first through the strategy that, you, that other people have for getting money into open source when you do open source. Um, so we got this is like the most famous one, right? Uh, you go to the experts who built the software, so they have the knowledge. So these are knowledge services, support, uh, consulting, training, and certifications. Uh, Canonical is uh, maybe not the example people think of first, but so obviously you can use Ubuntu for free, uh, but this gives you the ability to call support. This is a very important ability in uh, larger organizations. Like, people don't want to take individual personal liability for uh, the failure of open source software, right? You have to have some kind of commercial support. So there is a great natural incentive there. And this is what people mostly think of with, uh, when it comes to services, of course, Red Hat, uh, venerable, um, you know, extremely good vendor. Um, so th they offer support, they offer testing of the commercial um, versions of the software, uh, and they offer um, stability, really. So this data is slightly old now, but like you know, they're not doing badly, right? There's 64 quarters of revenue growth, um, and more recently they were bought by IBM, um, but also they were bought by IBM, right? So they're like, you know, if if you're say a new company like Elastic, and you look at the potential growth, and you're talking to your investors, you might need to figure out something that doesn't result in you being bought by IBM if that's not the exit you want, right? So sometimes growth, um, well, investors will necessitate growth and senior leadership will want to grow faster than services allow, basically. And there are also uh, a potential problem. Um, what if, so basically if your product is too easy to use, does that make it worse to survive financially? Um, I don't think the relationship is as straightforward as that, but it, it does seem like a weird incentive and that I know for a fact that it put off Elastic going down the services only route. Is, is it worrying? They were worried about that. Um, like I think Red Hat stuff is easy enough to use, but it's also been around for a long time. So there's like, you know, a lot of craft and problems, which is normal. Um, there will be that with Elastic too, right? And in, uh, in some more years, it's not even a decade old. Um, so then you got another problem, which is kind of the stability of the business and the predictability of revenue. Uh, in when you just got support contracts, you, you have churn, which is customers dropping off of like 30, 40 percent. There's a lot of different numbers in that space. But okay, right? Do you lose your you lose your third of your revenue every year? You got to replace it somehow. So you need a strategy. You need people. Like this takes work. Nothing happens automatically. Um, Another problem is that you can have service-only competition. Right? So 
you've got a company that does the R&D, right, like up to here, and then uh, they also sell the services. Uh, like, this is the effort that it takes. And then you've got a company that can uh, just make money by like, just selling the services, right? So they, maybe their effort is here, but they are competing with you. So they can afford lower prices because it's less effort. Uh, so they can outcompete you um, by certainly by price. And then service world price is a big thing. Like you don't have a like a feature to differentiate yourself. It's just a service. So if you're 40% more expensive, people might well go for something else. Um, this is a kind of a nice quote that I think summarizes it as a unique business model that was created at a certain other time, but now. Like newer companies are pretty scared. It's not just Elastic. Uh, there's a lot of other examples that we'll see here. It's like Redis, uh, Cockroach, uh, but there's a lot of um, new companies that don't do this. There's also a lot that do try this. You know, maybe if they are not going for stratospheric growth, then uh, they will. Uh, oh, uh, so Suse is also trying, well, it's not trying this, has been doing this for decades actually, but it's an independent company again as of seven months ago. Um, it's been like passed around a, a lot of buyers, and it has a similar model to Red Hat, and it's actually really stable. Uh, they sort of seem to ride the wave of new things like Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes, who hasn't heard of Kubernetes, and OpenStack and all of these new hot things, um, which helps them. Then you've got Open Core, which is what Elastic is. So th I'm, this is a lot of models here. You have dual licenses, uh, open platforms, like you have closed source distributions, commercial add-ons, things like security, monitoring, you pay for. Um, and there's a lot of examples of MongoDB, Datastax, Databricks, Redis Labs, uh, HashiCorp, Terraform, it's probably people uh, here who know that, Docker. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples for this because uh, I'll talk about Elastic at the very end. So MySQL is a dual licensing example. So it used to be that you would, it's like the same software, but you could get the community version or you could get the commercial uh, version with, like, to, with commercial modifications um, or to embed it in a commercial product, rather. But actually, now they do offer commercial-only features. So it's an open core company. Um, oh, Neo4j uh, is, is a graph uh, data store. It's very good. And so their enterprise edition consists of modules from the Neo4j community. So these are like GPL modules that other people wrote uh, and other closed source components which are like not public at all. Um, so the thing here is that if you're the company that develops the software, you're the, does this, yeah, does it work? Yeah, nah. well, anyway, you're the treadmill here, right? So you are, uh, the other companies are, adding value and they're adding services on top of that. And open source legally totally allows them to do that. But uh, you're going to you know, sit over here and look at them and be like, but, but I, develop, I put in all this effort. And you know, you're doing the same commercial work as me. And you, know, you're, you're, you might not feel great about that. Um, and so it's a different question of how sustainable that is. And I, I think as a sector, we're really still looking for the right model here. Uh, you have competing tools, so monitoring is a pretty wide field. Um, so other people can just build your, um, competitor to your extensions if you're selling security or monitoring or something like that. Um, so yeah, you, you are going to have a problem even if you're writing commercial code, uh, uh, closed source code. Uh, you have another problem with open core. You could make the entire thing a lot less open and uh, only more commercial and only focused on commercial because it's like, you know, sales doesn't really want to give much stuff away and oh, the engineers want everything to be open sourced. Uh, and depending on how sh things shift internally in the company, uh, it can end up like that you put a lot of commercial code into your open source project and that it becomes almost unusable without the commercial stuff. Um, and open source doesn't mean that it's not commercial, but it's more, um, more exactly, it can become unusable without the, the closed source stuff. And so, you know, that you kind of, okay, well, what was the point then? Uh, you know, we could have just built like, a closed source company, right? Um, so you still want to give back. And then, of course, you have the cloud providers. Like, if you're familiar, uh, like, oh, 
Redis and uh, Mongo and Elastic all have a problem where cloud providers will um, take the software and they will build, some, like, they'll offer it with monitoring, with security, with the same things that those companies are trying to make money out of. Um, they are totally allowed to do this. Like this is legit because it's an open source license. But um, it's a problem for those companies because they haven't figured out what else to do. And you know, the cloud providers say, well, it's the company's problems. And the companies say, well, we figured out how to build the software, and we're, like, we've tried a thousand things to make money with it, and you can't tell us what to do. You're another company, so you know, piss off. Um, and so this is where we're at as a field and, and a commercial open source uh, part. And then there's like cloud services, so where you want to, don't want to operationalize the software, you're happy, you kind of just want to use it, so you're just pretty much SaaS, you just want to pay for it. Um, but uh, there is a lot of use to be had from the open source version, like in terms of security, auditing, some people might genuinely want to build on it. So that's uh, one example is WordPress. Uh, you have open source. Uh, you, you have a WordPress.org, which like can download the project and is the community part, and WordPress.com, where you can buy hosting for WordPress from the company that makes WordPress. Um, they have something like this, like Sentry, and this is actually quite similar to some of Elastic's offerings. So it like aggregates error traces for you, like 150 of the same error, and it will categorize. Uh, and it's very clever about it. But people don't want to run this stuff. Like they don't want to have, like who monitors your monitoring infrastructure once you have it up? Who watches the, the watchers in this case? So they want to outsource this to someone else. And this is what Sentry allows you to do. Uh, so, you know, you make the cake, but beware you might not be the one uh, eating it or selling it in this case. Um, so, with the cloud providers, being able to capture market segments is uh, a significant issue because it can, like, for investors and senior leadership, it can cap your growth. So, even if you're doing okay now, they're thinking, you know, in the future, how big of a market can you aim for? And the cloud providers have a huge distribution uh, already and a huge reach among developers and enterprise customers. Uh, so this is a big problem for you if that's what you're trying to do uh, in order to make money from your open source. Uh, this is uh, the, somebody who worked on a lot of uh, open source projects. And they're just saying, you know, oh, pure open source models are becoming increasingly hard to uh, defend with public cloud, and this is a really simplified version. Uh, but nonetheless, you basically the company has, as I said, the R and D cost, um, and also the, the so the OSS development part over there, and also the cloud provider's margin to take care of. Whereas the cloud provider kind of just takes it, operationalizes it. Um, so. This, so this kind of make a lot of them getting into more controversial territory. You should be aware that not everyone shares this view. The intent of open source software was not so that someone else can take the exact same thing and offer it as a service. So I both, like, I agree with him in the sense that, yeah, when I say open source, I think of like community involvement or uh, drinking uh, beers in, in Brussels or wandering the halls uh, here at Open Fest, which is my first Open Fest, by the way. So uh, thank you for putting it on and for participating. Um, but, the, you know, I do agree. You, know, you think of collaboration across borders, of, of making friends, and uh, of building interesting things. You, you don't really think that, oh, somebody will take exactly what I did and just resell it. So it's true insofar that that is the case. But, uh, like, this guy also conflates open source and source available licensing, which are very different things. Um, and like he's a VC, which is it doesn't mean that he doesn't understand the problems, but I'm like he's not as emotionally invested in open source as all of you are that you know gotten off your asses on, on the weekend to come here to talk about open source. Um, so it's important to see these things in context uh, of the people that talk about them and if, uh, of their incentives. So. Yeah, I, I do agree that it's not the intent, uh, but I don't have an answer for what the, the right path forward is. Right. But anyway, another, moving on, another um, way that you make money is partnerships. Uh, so he, who here knows how Mozilla makes a large percent of its money? 
Right, okay, yeah, yeah, of course you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to give it like a slightly less controversial example uh, here. So Yahoo paid Mozilla 375 million in 2015, and they're going to pay like the same amount. They obligated themselves to pay the same amount each year uh, through 2019, like five-year contract for making Yahoo Search the default search provider in the U.S., but just in the U.S. And uh, of course, there's the more controversial that uh, Google does a similar thing for presumably other regions. Uh, I don't know the exact details, but um, yeah, the, these organizations are somewhat opposed in their principles. So the problem here, we talk about how to make money though in open source and how to live together with that. So this is too domain specific. Some partnerships work, but for a lot of software, this is not really an option. Like if you go to a small library, yeah, you're not really going to partner with Yahoo. Um, another very common model is donations. So you have, actually, does anybody remember SourceForge? The source, yeah. <laughs> so SourceForge actually allowed you to do donate. It supported donations for software projects. Um, and then there is uh, Vue.js as well. It's supported via Patreon. And they, like the, the creator of it is uh, enabled to work full time on it because of that. So. Uh, it works for some projects. Um, Open Collective is a tool I want to mention. Like, if you have a project um, or you know of a project, so they uh, provide the tools to raise money and provide transparency to your donors. And they uh, have, like, and just practically, they have a thing um, that allows JavaScript programmers to enter, like, a post installation message. So, when you install the module via NPM, um, via the node package manager, it shows you something that asks for a donation. Um, yeah, so th that's kind of interesting approach. I guess it's more modern. Um, a very famous different example uh, is Wikimedia. Uh, so they do like they seem to be able to get a consistent level of donations, and we're doing like 90 million dollars like every year. Uh, so they they know what they're doing. They can kind of rely on this. They can hire staff. Um, it's quite a lot of stuff, but I don't, I'm not aware of anyone figuring it out on that scale with a piece of software, right? So I don't know of anyone who purely does donation based like at this level. Uh, so this makes it really hard to plan. And when you hire people, they have to do, you know, uh, pesky things like pay them a pension and then benefits and all these weird, um, European social ideas. Um, so yeah, you got the, the problem of scaling and, and uh, of uh, planning that. Um, uh, this is Stephanie, this is by Stephanie Hurlbert, and that the second part. So I got a lot of text on these slides. There, the um, the ideas are quite important to see in there. I'm kind of quoting their original authors. So uh, the important thing is like the second paragraph. Just read the second paragraph. You can point to donation models that had it easy, and I can point to traditional businesses that got lucky too. Um, and that, this is very true, right? There's actually a lot of factors when it comes to analyzing this. Uh, and what I'm doing here is more qualitative, not quantitative analysis. So uh, there's a lot to be said for circumstance, luck, timing, and so on, that makes some of these examples work. And they might not work today. So this is the case why some companies don't go service only. Uh, I highly recommend following Stephanie Hurlbert on uh, social media. Uh, she's a, a pretty incredible person. Uh, so she actually she has a two-person company, and they do now also publish open source. They didn't used to publish any. Uh, they have seven figures in booked revenue. Seven figures. So t minim a minimum of ten. It doesn't say how much, but that's a minimum of ten million dollars in one year. Two-person company. Um, uh, she's great. She's very supportive of uh, mentorship initiatives. She helps people all across tech. And she has some very interesting thoughts on business models and you know, on selling and how to do it humanely and not lie to people and not be sleazy and so on. Um, so I, I recommend her, her thinking. OK, so another approach is certified partners. Uh, so Moodle does this. And you basically, yeah, uh, you as the company, like you sit here and you say, well, you people have to come to us and we will certify that you know everything uh, to provide services, uh, not on our behalf, but you know, we will certify you that you have the ability to provide services. Uh, so that's one option. 
but it requires a commercial ecosystem of people already using the software and like the kind of people who would pay for services. So Moodle is an education software, right? So you can have schools and universities that will pay for it. So it uh, doesn't work for everyone. Uh, you have ads. Uh, that's one option. Uh, Adblock actually has this list of uh, white listed ads. So uh, that's one, uh, one way of doing this. Um, and then you have that. So that's like a kind of like Open Collective, but uh, NPM installed funding. And this is what it shows you. So it, it required some interaction, and it was a bit more maybe intrusive than people liked. Uh, yeah, this was a, a total um, um, thinking of a stage appropriate word. Uh, it was a big controversy <laughs> at the time. This is very recent. Uh, so the developers just hated the idea of having ads on the terminal. That was it. Uh, so I, I don't know how well this is going to work. Uh, but Git, GitHub and NPM are actually both offering like, other ways to support people, so uh, directly via the, the platforms. So maybe that will, um, that will work, although that, so that's more sponsorship rather than ads. Um, so like, yeah, so at, this has got the problem of pricing, like how do you price ads? Um, like at what point is it acceptable? What level of ads is acceptable? What kind of money is acceptable to have an ad? Um, it's a bit more complicated. This is uh, another way, a super minor one, is merchandise. Uh, you sell branded products and get some percentage. Uh, OpenBSD does that. Uh, the problem is, of course, that people might not want to buy your stuff. Um, and it's as simple as that. It's just not a big enough channel for hiring and paying pensions and all that. Um, you have then bounties and crowdfunding. So the crowdfunding is like the opposite of bounties almost. Um, it's, so crowdfunding is like where you offer to write some software and like, you, know, you go on Kickstarter or something similar. And bounties is you pay for a specific feature to be added. Uh, I, get, I see this more of an add-on to uh, projects where the people are not being paid. Um, so like you get some extra time, but you probably can't run a company on these. And uh, that's an example of the Kickstarter approach. Uh, so this actually just this is just a nice example because it actually got delivered on time from Kickstarter, right? That's quite unusual uh, back in 2013. Um, and yeah, we, we already mentioned Vue.js. So Evan Yu is being paid full time now from Patreon, just from donations. And the problem um, with those two models, three models, uh, donations, ads, uh, is uh, vision, so where do you want to go with it, and maintainability, like, and how sustainable is it? Um, you have corporate sponsoring, so uh, like Ruby Together is one example of this, mm, and also the Google Summer of Code is sort like you don't get really paid, but people get paid to help you. Um, the problem here is incentives, like the companies. Uh, you're sort of incentivized to just do their work and you know and make money and you have to convince them You have to work really hard to convince them to do this stuff uh, like at elastic we last time we tried to run this we did not get very many uh, uh, Internally we didn't get very many responses like to people willing to be a mentor from our engineers uh, Which is a bit of a shame, but like you know it, they're on their release train choo-choo and they just didn't have the time um, so yeah, like we are probably going to try to do something about this because we do care about open source a lot, but it shows the problem, right? That you have to keep going back kind of artificially to it. So let's talk a little bit about what struggles uh, you might go through once you try to mix money and open source together. Uh, this is a quote by Jesse Frazel. Uh, if you're claiming your startup is open source and you don't contribute anything upstream, then you're sorry, not sorry, but you're not open source. Uh, that, this is true. Uh, there is this model of makers who are like, oh, yeah, we love makers. There's the people who build things. Users, yeah, we like them too. Uh, there, it's a bit more work, but yeah, we like them. Uh, we need them, of course. Like, that's, that we, we like the motivation it gives us as well. And then there is sort of the taker's idea that some people consume and they, they, they don't give anything back. So that's a sustainability problem. Um, so and uh, this is a good illustration of what I was talking about earlier, where you have some companies that do uh, services on top of the work that you did. Um, so that the makers have to split uh, their efforts and uh, uh, the takers. Yeah. Uh, 
not so much. So they just build their stuff. Um, they make their money on their pro proprietary intellectual property. Uh, and then they give less to open source than they could. Um, there is one particular company, and we're sort of like Elastic is arg always arguing with it. So take this with a grain of salt, because like, obviously I work for Elastic. But I can't not mention it, because it would otherwise be a weird presentation without it. Um, so um, that's an example of that point of view. I think actually Amazon do do things for open source. Um, but there are a lot of people who don't think that they do enough, right? So like, that's what I mean by this slide. Uh, and like, I, I'm not going to ask like, like, an opinion about this, because yeah, Elastic always argues with them. So, uh, so if uh, there's also like the brand recognition thing. And we've, we have this problem, too, um, at Elastic with uh, Amazon uh, Elastic Search Service. Um, so if you know, like people start thinking that those cloud providers actually make the projects, uh, this is more common than you think. Like I've been asked actually quite a few times, oh, oh Elastic, oh, you, uh, so you work for Amazon. I'm like, yeah, not, not really, no. Um, so like, the, I think that they could definitely put in a bit more effort, that not just Amazon, like all of the cloud providers, into uh, giving credit back, like as well as code and all that stuff. Um, so Redis has a particular model there as well. So you have uh, it, their modules are AGPL, but then they modify their license with a commons clause, which is not open source. Uh, so and that's what it is. So it will not include the right to sell the software. Uh, you can agree or disagree with the intention here, but like that's what they decided was right. Uh, there's actually a lot of companies that have a similar clause now. Um, Elastic has also done something similar, but not for all of the software. Like the core projects are totally open source. It's just extra stuff we build. We'll talk about it at the end. Um, yeah, but it's like it, it's a bit of a naming confusion with Creative Commons, and yeah, you're modifying a license, which is a a bit of an issue, and it also causes controversy. Uh, so I, I'd say, in hindsight, well, I, I not worked for one of the companies that did the open the Commons clause specifically, but it does it doesn't seem to me like it was really worth the the extra effort, or rather, it was worth it for them. But there may be better ways. Um, I'll skip for that. So yeah. The, uh, so this is a thing by Amazon. The maintainers have a responsibility to ensure that like, the primary distribution remains free of proprietary code. This is, of course, true. And the community can build on the project freely. But uh, they, when you target with that sentence, when you target the stuff that people are not making open source intentionally, like, they keep the, the core. This is in open core models. The core projects are still uh, open source. Um, so this is sort of very convenient if you are a company that has to take those projects and make money from them. Uh, but um, like in the cases where the project does make the core not open source, then I have to agree with Amazon. Uh, like, you know, yeah, OK, it, you used community effort to get to here, and now it's just too hard uh, to figure out the business model. Yeah, it, it's really unfortunate, because a lot of the authors of the software work for you, but you know. It's supposed to be open source, right? That's what we're here for. And I think that's maybe it, right? Some people get to we're here for open source, get from we're here for open source to we're here to pay salaries. Like, this is a much bigger responsibility now I'm, that I'm a leader of a company. Um, so, yeah. Uh, um, so, we're going to skip a few of these because uh, we don't have time. And I'd like to talk to you about some other uh, things, that some w other ways of making money from it. Um, so we just talked about the open source versus the commercial view. And I don't know how many of you know, but Cassandra and Datastax had actually a bit of an ugly split over this. And so there are a lot of problems when a single organization has the ownership of the project, 
like Elastic does, uh, and they host all the documentation and is doing the client. And if the people in the commercial organization are not super self-aware, uh, they get into this mode of, oh, I, I need to make money, I need to make my payroll, and I need to do all these things, I need to get customers. And so they stop thinking quite so much of the point of view uh, of the open source project. Oh, it can get pretty complicated. Uh, and like this is, yeah, like, you know. So uh, Datastax is basically saying, oh, well, our commercial, ver our closed source version uh, is um, uh, twice as fast as the open source version that it was based on. And that's, well, right, but, you know, you, you can only do this because of all that work that went into it before. So this is not really the right approach, but it can easily happen. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's faster, so Scylla is, is um, faster, but the Cassandra ecosystem is now also a bit split because of this, so. Um, so do you take venture capital, and here's kind of where we uh, get into uh, the more uh, businessy side, really. Uh, it will accelerate your development, but then you don't get to make all the decisions. Um, this is a very famous spreadsheet. I recommend that you have a look. It's just oss.cash. Um, and this is like a list of venture-funded commercial open source companies. Um, it's uh, by Joseph Jacks, who's a VC, who's kind of like uh, analyzing the commercial open source field pretty deeply. It's, uh, uh, it's quite an interesting sheet to look through. Um, you have the, like the, Theoretical problem here is, you, do you set the bar a bit too low and you cripple your open source product, uh, or like, do you die as a company? Can, do, you, do you hobble your growth, um, or you know, do, do you find a sustainable business model? Like, and the, with VC, you have to do this in a time frame, otherwise you're dead. So, um, Influx, DB, um, is a bit more niche, but it's actually it's a competitor to Elastic, I should say. So I probably like, I, I don't want to you know, diss them. Uh, that's it's a really good product. Uh, but Rethink DB was very loved, but the company went out of business, right? Because the they like sought funding too little and too late, essentially. Uh, and so now, we, yeah, uh, as far as I know, we are not seeing any major um, development there, and it's a shame because they had a lot of interesting features. Uh, Docker is still floating on VC, but I don't know how much business they're actually getting. Like, I haven't heard of a lot of enterprise movement there, but I don't work for Docker, so there might be. Um, so there's the question, are you just using VC money? Uh, SQLite is kind of interesting. It's like a bit of a trick. It is fully open source, but they don't take any p p pull requests, no PRs at all. And the tests are closed source. So it's essentially impossible to do, to fork or commercialize it. Like, that's the, the big thing, really. Um, so you have to go to them if you want consulting or like embedding commercially and all that. Um, so business is actually optional. You don't need, in conclusion, you don't actually need to um, build a business around your open source uh, project. Like Postgres um, doesn't have a company behind it, super famous project. Uh, this guy, Matt Klein, decided to not start anything um, uh, around Envoy. Uh, which is sort of in the container and Kubernetes space. It's like a, it's a pretty involved project. I'm not going to go through exactly what it does, but he looked at it. He had enough traction to start a company. He was just like, um, yeah, no, I like my life as it is. So business is pretty complicated. Um, so the, uh, the question is, do you want to look, what do we want as a field to look for an, a new model and some people say that this, like, the open core and the adding of a commons clause and uh, similar approaches is the new model. Um, it's, I'm not entirely convinced. So it's kind of almost trying to solve the problem that people don't contribute back or other companies don't contribute back to you. Uh, and one example is, another example is CockroachDB with their business source license. See, it's the same thing, cannot offer a, a commercial version. Uh, Cheers, thank you. I might need to go over about five minutes, but hope as we have lunch next, do we? You got, we got lunch, all right, okay. That's, that's a big topic. Uh, but so are the only two alternatives hobby and VC? 
No, obviously not, of course not. That's a rhetorical question. Um, this is the company I used to run. It's called Cottage Labs. It's an agency, um, a loose partnership of hipster freelancers. All of these people want open source software from us, and we were paid to build it. Uh, so there's definitely work to be found. But there is open source and open source. These projects are not super popular, right? As you can see up there, the numbers. So we built a lot of stuff. There's four pages of repositories in our GitHub, and they're largely not very used. So you know, when you say open source and you want to work on open source, do you just want it for the cool factor, or like, how far is your adoption going to go? Do you have a strategy for that and a strategy to make money? It it's becomes quite a lot. So obviously you got consulting, um, but here what I want to recommend you is uh, productized consulting. So uh, just to look into the the concept. Yeah. Um, so you, the idea here is you divorce the time you spend from the money you make. All right, okay, we, we need to finish up. All right, cool. Um, I, I got very little left. So uh, another option is you can just sell SaaS based on your service. And I highly recommend that you check out these two things, so just record those, uh, microconf and startups for the rest of us. Uh, these are essentially bootstrap, like these people are trying to figure out how to do this kind of stuff without VC funding. They're not open source focused, but you can learn a lot if you're thinking of commercializing a project. And, and now so that my, uh, my colleagues here don't, uh, you know, don't cut my head off. Um, elastic strategy on this is basically to have open source code, but to also sell cloud services, closed source, uh, so source available, but commercial, so you're not allowed to use it for free. Uh, and you, a lot of stuff that you are allowed to use completely for free is not a trial, there is no limitations, but uh, it's not open source. Like, you can't collaborate with it. Uh, so, yeah, and we do training, consulting, um, subscriptions, and the, these are four ways, like services, uh, training, consulting, the, the Elastic Cloud subscriptions, and then um, the closed source stuff. All right, so. Cheers, thank you very much. <laughs> Three minutes over, so for questions, you, you're gonna say that bit? Or? Thank okay. you very much, Emmanuel. Right. Uh, for questions, you can follow him uh, back there in the speaker's room.